Hello, I'm Sue Bertwistle and I produced Hotel du Lac. And I'm Giles Foster, the director. And Christopher Hampton, who wrote the screenplay. The project actually happened. Um, Anna Massey and I decided that we wanted to uh, to do a project together. And uh, it, was, it was an actor, actually, Peter Eyre, who suggested that we looked at the work of Anita Bruckner. Um, and I thought that was absolutely the right territory for Anna Massey. So I, I actually wrote to Anita Bruckner and asked her if she would write an original screenplay for us. She actually said she wouldn't know how to begin the process, but she had this little book that was about to be published, and would I be interested in reading it? Um, and that was Hotel du Lac. Um, luckily, I bought the rights to it before it was published, and then uh, it went on to win the Booker Prize, so it wasn't a problem then selling it to the BBC. My dearest David, a cold coming I had of it. Penelope drove me to the airport as if escorting some prisoner to the maximum security wing. No doubt I shall be allowed back eventually to... Christopher was the, um, Christopher Hampton was the first choice of screenwriter and, um, well, we set to work pretty quickly on it. I... I was trying to remember how quickly I'd written the script, and I think it was probably in about three weeks, because there was a, um, a, a sort of window of opportunity to do the film that summer. Yes. And, uh, and so it had to be written pretty quickly, didn't it? That's that's right, yes. You did a very, very fast first, first draft. And that was the stage that you came on, Giles, then. Yes, I read the book, and, and very soon afterwards, um, by chance, uh, was offered the script and uh, or the possibility of directing and I think at that stage Christopher had just started writing and we talked about the way it would go and very exceptionally and it's exceptional even after these years um, Christopher not exceptional for him but exceptional for a lot of English writing he delivered a screenplay which is actually remarkably similar to uh, what I think is on the screen certainly in terms of, of, of the tone of the piece, I hope he would agree, and the, the, in, in also in, in a very, also a very exceptional way for many films, in terms of structure, because one of the great things about English television, and indeed English film, is its dependence on literature, and one of the great pitfalls is thinking that it's easy to adapt something, and I think that in this case it was a particular achievement because it's a deceptive novel. It, is, it isn't a simple novel. It's multi-layered, both in terms of structure and character. And uh, even as we speak, I'm looking at a, a script, a slightly dusty copy, which uh, I can see is very, very similar to the, the shots and the tone of uh, what's happening on the screen at this moment. Yes, I think one of the main problems, well, Christopher, you'll tell me, but one of the main problems is the, the, the time sequence, the, the way the information is actually given about the, the backstory and... Yes, it seemed necessary to, to maintain a kind of mystery uh, as long as possible or to meet out very gently the, uh, the, the facts and, you know, keep people's interest in that way. <clears throat> I must say that uh, I've done quite a lot of adaptation and... Uh, this was really one of the greatest pleasures that I've ever had as an adapter, partly because um, it's it's written with such tremendous lucidity. You really do understand every nuance of every character. And, you know, happily for the dialogue writer, a lot of the dialogue is, is really uh, playable, speakable. I mean, so often when you adapt writers, you, you novelists, you have to completely start again because they're not particularly interested or uh, or, or able to um, to reproduce the way people people speak. Mm -hmm. uh, Anita Bruckner has a, a, not only her own style, which is sort of unmistakable, um, but she has a very good ear. Um, yeah. So, so a lot of this, a lot of the, the hard graft was done for, done for me. 
what we're watching now is is in a way the um, coming to the end of the very uh, adroit introduction of the different characters. Uh, one thing which I think led to a success, the success it had beyond our expectations and dreams, was the, the fact that there were so many wonderful actors that we were able to secure for it. Um, partly a tribute to Sue, partly a tribute to the script, and and partly luck. Um, some things fall out that way, and I think that without exception, we got the people we wanted for yes. every every part. Absolutely, yes. And even John Mark Barr, who plays the waiter, is now an international star. Yes, <laughs> he was actually just on the cusp of it. He'd he'd done King David at this time, but I don't think it had been shown. So we got him just for a very small part, actually. But it's it's good to have good actors in those those very small parts. A particular favourite of mine, although it's very hard to to make any kind of choices, is Googie Withers, uh, Mrs. Pusey, who is so much a wonderful, larger than life character. Uh, but played without any degree of self-comment or uh, mannerism. And uh, it, it was wonderful to get an actress of such experience and with a whole history that, that she brought to the role. Uh, and also somebody who could comment on, without going against the spirit of it, on the Englishness of the, the character. Um, I, mean, I always think of Googie as being part English, part Australian, um, rightly, and I think that the, the way that she interpreted the nuance of text, the, the pronunciation, even a word like hotel, which I think we're about to hear in a moment, uh, just defined a class and a person and, and was actually a benchmark for lots of other moments in the film. She prefers to believe she's going to be discovered, looking her best. The other bonus of having Googie, of course, was that she she became um, a sort of company leader um, to to support all the other actors, and in a, in a social way, she was forever organising um, parties and drinks, boat trips, and I mean, <laughs> a, a magical day when she she appeared at breakfast and told us all to get on a launch and cross the lake to. To have lunch. It makes it sound as if it was more of a holiday than a than a film shoot. Of course, it was ter terribly hard work being in a five star hotel and going down and swimming in the morning and then having a luxury breakfast and then shooting for a few minutes or two and then uh, no, it was it was one of those dream jobs in all sorts of ways and and I think actually the 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 apparent luxury of it was right in one sense. I think but the one criticism we, we, we made to ourselves, and I think actually fortunately didn't get back very much, was that the hotel was rather grander than the novel. Um, it, it was quite hard to find the right location, right by the lake, um, in a hotel that at that time of year was prepared to have us, because not only did we use it as the location, but as you said, we actually stayed in the hotel. It's the first and last time that I've actually filmed and stayed in the hotel. And they were absolutely perfect hoteliers, weren't they? That as long as you wanted to stay up, the swimming pool would be open. Or... Sorry, it's now sunny again uh, like that holiday. <laughs> I'm starting to feel quite envious because, of course, the BBC, then as now, uh, was unable to pay for writers to, uh, to partake in these uh, foreign uh, adventures. I think the, one of the other bonuses was having an actress of the calibre of Julia Mackenzie in a part that had so few lines. I mean, she appears quite a lot. About 12 lines, I think, she counted. And we were so oh, well, lucky that she um, wanted to do it. Sad eyes, I said. <laughs> is this your first visit to the hotel? It is, yes. Oh, yes, pronunciation of hotel just seems to me to be so immensely precise. And she carries the whole kind of snobbery of the woman with, without it being in any way caricature. It was good enough to open a little account for me there. I think what Christopher said earlier about the mystery element is really interesting because a failing of a lot of British films, he said arrogantly, is to think that it's interesting merely to watch characters and characters developing. And because there's a genuine mystery, although quite a gentle mystery, to what's happened to Edith, uh, uh, one is drawn into it and, and, and made to, to work out exactly what is happening, in, not only in Edith's mind, but obviously with what has happened in London in the past. And there's also the other parallel mystery of, what, of who the Denham Elliott character is and um, 
is he sleeping with you see, when uh, my Mrs. Pierce's daughter? Out, he was quite prepared to stay on at Green Tiles, but I wouldn't have dreamt of allowing him to do all that traveling. So we found the most beautiful big flat in St. John's Wood. Jennifer has her own self-contained suite, and it's very convenient. The shopping is excellent. Of course, we have everything delivered. I seem to remember there was a huge debate on Anna's costumes about the, the cardigans. Do you remember this, Giles? Or is it too long ago to remember? No, I do remember, yeah. Actually, she's not wearing a cardigan yes. there, but there's a huge oh, debate nice. about how many and the colours and the style um, and the age of the cardigans, um, which they are actually, they do feature a lot in the, in the rather, text. Rather significantly in the text, yes. Yes, um, as we'll see later, um, when, when the Denim Elliott character um, yes. takes her to task about now, wearing her cardigans when they're on the, on the boat trip. I have a weakness for nice things, I'm afraid. And there's such a good shop in Zurich. It's one of the reasons why we come back here every year. <laughs> and that's Jennifer's bedroom, of course. Well, it's all right. You know, my dear, you ought to buy yourself something pretty while you're here. If you want to feel good, you've got to look good. That's what I'm always telling Jennifer, aren't I, my darling? If we economised on Anna Massey's cardigans, oh, we certainly didn't on Googie Withers' like frocks. Um, frocks and jewels. <laughs> frocks, jewels and even shoes, which, which I think much. probably were more expensive than were warranted by the number of shots the director gave them. <laughs> well, you know where we are now, dear, don't you? Although actresses do say that having the right alone. shoes means that they can actually play the character correctly. <laughs> I've noticed in recent years that Anita Bruckner's books are rather harshly received by the critics, um, and I've decided that this is probably because they deal in extremely uncomfortable truths, um, which people wish to somehow resist or put behind them or, or deny. Which truths? Well, the, the, fact, that, the fact that people like the Pusies um, uh, grabbed themselves uh, an unreasonable amount of the uh, uh, you know pleasures of the world, um, whereas more reticent characters like uh, like I suppose the characters that usually come as the central characters of her novels um, tend to have their faces trodden on by uh, in the stampede for for pleasure. Um, and Which that's... is what she says in the restaurant scene about the tortoise and the hare, that in fiction... Um, that's right. ..that the, the worthy, um, slower Anita one gets the man, but actually in life it's not not at all true. I do think Anita Bruckner exactly. believes that, actually. Yes, I'm sure I she don't... does. I'm sure she does. And, and so w when these, you know, perfectly crafted novels arrive year after year, always with a tremendously well, high, high level of skill and, can, you know, perfectly constructed and so on um, it's the fact that they they contain these sort of desolate um, observations at the, at the center of them that, 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 that people uh, object to but it, it's it seems to me that it that you know she's one of those writers who creates a very definite universe that belongs to nobody else that is her own territory and um, I, I think that's a, a remarkable achievement, mm. and uh, and the books are extremely consistently good. So I think. Just on the, on the bit we're watching now, um, part of the problem in any uh, dramatization is is getting over the uh, history of the characters. Um, if there is a history that you need to get over. And in, in this, there were t two ways that made it easier f for us, or for you, Christopher, mm. in that, one, she's a novelist, so she can actually, as a novelist, comment on what she's seeing and who she's seeing. Even if she gets it wrong the first time, she then reassesses. Um, but she also has someone that she is writing to, her lover back in, in London. So we have the letters that she can um, give us the information. Yes, that's right. Yes, that did make things. Did make the other things. thing that was a pleasure that comes out of that is the 
the fact of being a writer and being exposed, as she is at this moment, by, by Dana Medic's writer. arrival with the Little Black Notebook, who's redolent of many writers, including Alan Bennett. I mean, the, 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 the need to write things down and also the, the, the kind of um, hope that you might be exposed, um, even though you want to hide your notebooks. There's, a, there's an element of that. But also, I think, the, the, the a thing which is, is, is pertinent to all literature... Uh, uh, to, to, to the novel, I mean, from the 18th century through to B.S. Johnson or something, where there's a kind of self-reflexive thing that happens, uh, which is very interesting, and also the discrepancy between what the writer's life and 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 style is and the and the novel she's writing. I mean, Edith Edith Hope is not writing an Edith Hope novel. She's she's um, writing a Vanessa Wild Wild novel, and she. Uh, it, it, it's the sort of novel that you might not buy at the airport, and 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 so we had a lot of fun with the the um, distinction of tone between between art and life within this art. After all, I lead a much fuller life. I'm always surprised she never uses me in any of her books. I do. Do you remember Giles trying to shoot in these tiny little Kensington Place? I think. Uh, well, it's um, it's one of the muse. The smaller streets in Notting Hill. Yes, yes and we decided continuing. that she would have something of that size. But then, actually, trying to get a film crew into tiny, tiny rooms. I do remember visiting there, and I was particularly amused as I used to live yeah. in Kensington Place when I first came to London, and I knew just how tiny the rooms were going to be. <laughs> well, it was in the days when, when, when the BBC really didn't like to build sets. Although, of course, it would have made a practical if not economic sense, economic sense as well. And, and, and there, were, there were many films that, that, that I think we were all involved in those days, um, from the, the, the glamorous Hotel de Lac to, to social realism in, in Yorkshire, where you would be crammed into a teenager's bedroom and, and unable to photograph more than uh, the end of their nose. And, uh, I mean, mercifully, common sense has prevailed more. I mean, Hollywood had it right in terms of building sets and, and moving actors around and putting different lenses on. And Able to move the walls out. It just makes it all yeah. so much quicker. Much quicker and, and more comfortable, yes. Mm. I'm going to have to turn you out, I'm afraid. Richard will be back any minute. He's just dumping his wife off somewhere. It also actually makes a, a difference to the look of things. That it was, uh, I mean, I think that traditionally people didn't mind shooting um, for a while in small rooms because they had the, the illusion that they were doing a documentary and it's somewhere going to be more truthful. But of course, when you have more space and you can light it more adroitly, as indeed Ken McMillan did with this, you can make a more beautiful film and, and um, keep the camera moving in a different way. And it does mean that uh, the crew's not sitting on the actor's knees or vice versa as you're <laughs> trying to get the shots. <laughs> well, sometimes they might want to. Mm -hmm. right? I find the uh, theme tune so oddly affecting after so much time. I don't know if it's because we spent so long in the music recordings, but it's, it's a haunting tune that Carl Davis uh, wrote for it. That was the first time, actually, I'd worked with Carl Davis. You, you'd worked with him before. I had and loved him because he, he uh, brings a completely unique sensibility to, to what he does. I mean, I, I always think of him as being... You can't imagine it's more American than English. He's appalled when I tell him he still has an American accent. Um, well, he does. Which he does. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, Brooklyn is not forgotten, and, and he should be very proud. But he, the, the thing is that he, he is able, because I think partly of, of so much experience, but in particular experience in writing for silent movies, he is able to both underscore a character and, and, and have the general theme of what somebody's feeling, but also spot particular moments, which, which of course comes from a silent movie scoring, where a raised eyebrow can spark a particular note, uh, introduction of a particular instrument, or whatever. And I think that, that something which it plays on a slightly heightened level, which, which Hotel du Lac does, I mean, it's not... I mean, there's endless discussions about naturalism, which I think, you know, one doesn't really want to entertain now, but it, it, it means that you raise the... The, the level of expectation and the pleasure, I think. The other wonderful thing about working with Carl is he's so knowledgeable about the whole history of music that I, I find whenever I work I with him, I just learn so much. It's like having um, the best musical teacher. You have a, a yes. re really good musical education uh, by working with him. 
Monica. Edith. Not with Elmar Pusey today, then. I didn't feel quite up to her this early in the morning. I can't stand the sight of her myself. Of course, Sunday's the one day they can't swan around buying knickers. <laughs> oh, I do beg your pardon. Lingerie. Not that I'd put it past her to bang up some wretched little shopkeeper on a Sunday simply because she happened to have a spare few thousand francs. They do seem it's to a do a wonderful line, thing. I think. Yes. <laughs> I was just thinking how unsentimentally uh, Daddy was Patricia Hodge plays the role, um, and, uh, uh, which means that eventually she does actually become a very, very touching, mm. um, because her struggle against um, the difficulties of her own character um, is so sort of grimly fought. Um, it's it's very moving, I think. Getting Irene to stand there and get on and off the boat was um, a task that you had, Giles, because, in fact, she was in incredible pain throughout the whole of filming, if you remember, she with with her legs. And well, yes, I mean, actually, the t it was a miracle getting her to Switzerland. Um, I mean, she was absolutely determined that she would do the part and be there, and, yes. and, and we were totally... I mean, I'd been totally in love with her, I think, since seeing her in... Um, in films like um, um, I'm All Right Jack, I'm All Right Jack, or Morgan Suitable Case for for, for Treatment, mm -hmm. and and uh, yes, playing David David Warner's uh, mother, I, I mean, and so she was a legend, and so we were I'm just delighted. But she she, remember, she had a battle, I think, to, to keep going sometimes. Do you remember when we went to? Um, she asked us to go and talk to her. We were very definitely auditioned by her to see if um, we were good enough. I think definitely yes. In the flat with her dogs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> She also had this extraordinary uh, waspishness, which which was very pleasing and um, rather unexpected in, in, a, in a woman of that age and, and apparent composure. I mean, the composure side was manifest in her sitting on her second floor balcony, uh, remaking her address book, which is something which was really extensive and quite alarming for a woman of that age to be making a new address and telephone list. But then she would... Um, at the end of the day, you know, we'd be so exhausted by filming and swimming and enjoying ourselves that, that she would come down about seven o'clock and find us in the barn and almost sort of corral us into um, helping across the road to, to drink vast quantities of wine and eat fish. I mean, she was, she was, she, I mean, after Googie, she was, she was part, party leader. Wonderful stories as well. Yes, yeah, some some not really repeatable on on the, on this adventure, but but certainly a, a whole history of, of uh, something. Again, one of the things that, that that I found very pleasurable was was to find a script which was a, about apparently uh, non sexy people because older people. I mean, I think it, it, it was one of the reasons that I really fell in love with the whole idea of doing it. I spent a lot of my childhood with elderly parents and with old relations, particularly in Switzerland, in fact, where we used to holiday. And, and so it was a, a strange... I mean, directors don't have the pleasure of um, digging into their own backgrounds and memories as much as writers, but in this case, it, it touched a lot of chords for me to, to, to be in a place photographing people in a way that I'd almost eavesdropped conversations as, as, a, as a, a teenager and, um, and, and to find out the unexpected things, to find out that somebody in their 80s had the most sort of extraordinary sex life or, or a history of violence or something is, 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 is very pleasurable and it's one of the, the sidelines of, of, of the job of directing films. So aren't you coming for lunch? I need another piece of cake. Thinking of um, the delight of working with Denham as well, I don't know whether I'm actually allowed to tell the following story, but I suppose as, uh, Denham's no longer with it. Actually, Denham wouldn't mind if he were with us if I told the story, but um, it can always be cut out. On the first morning of shooting, we were shooting in the corridor where Denham had his room that he was actually um, staying in, and he came out with a glass of water, and he said, would you, would you like a drink? And I said, oh, yes, thank you. And he brought me what I thought was also a tumbler of water. 
and I took a swig of it and it turned out to be neat vodka that Denham was drinking at 10 in the morning. Um, Mornings weren't his best time and in fact uh, something which I learnt on the first day was this man of uh, this act of such apparent composure was extremely nervous and, and that he would be talking nervously right up until the moment I said action and even beyond it when the cigarette that he was clutching like a, a, an army sergeant major between his thumb and his first finger would go behind his back and he would become as composed as if he'd just come out of a, 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 a sauna and he would deliver the lines silkily and then even before I'd set, said cut he would say, is that all right? and put the cigarette back in his mouth. And it's the most extraordinary education to me there, I mean, as a comparatively young director, to see the control that he had over his own nerves. It's a particular thrill for me to work with Denim Elliott. He's an actor I always admire enormously. Um, and um, at the first read-through, uh, he came over to me and said, um, oh, well, we're going to have to do quite a lot of work on this. So I said, oh, do you think so? He said, Yes, uh, there's quite a lot of work to be done. Um, so we then, we then had the read-through, uh, and I was sitting there wondering what I'd done wrong or why there was so much work to be done. And after the reading, he came out to me and he said, it was quite wrong, reads perfectly well. I were rather bored. He was so professional, though. Because the only thing he insisted on was that no-one spoke to him in makeup first thing in the morning. Um, but as soon as he came out, he was absolutely fine and always word perfect. Wonderful actor. Yes, just, wonderful actor. Um, not as remembered as he should be, I don't think. Um, uh, although, I mean, there isn't a film that he appeared in that, that he doesn't improve by his presence. Just to say something about the locations, I mean, it, I think it's just so apt that Anita Bruckner set the story in, in Switzerland. I mean, although she actually wrote it to be um, set, and, 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 and set in, on Lake Geneva, and we did it on, on Lake Lucerne at Witznau, in fact, um, it, it, there's something which everybody, it's almost a truism to say that, that Switzerland is, is a kind of country in aspic or a convalescent country. And, and Edith Hope's convalescence is, is one of the apparent themes of the uh, film. And I think it, there's something which gets to you I'll as soon as you anywhere, step off the plane in Switzerland of being in another I world. And I think that that, without any help from anybody really, gets into a film any time you point a camera at a Swiss um, square or across a lake. It, you're, you're in a kind of opera set. We did actually visit the original Hotel du Lac that Anita Bruckner herself stayed in when we first looked for the location, which was on uh, Lake Geneva. Uh, but it was right on a very, very busy road, on a sort of island. It had been isolated on a, a sort of traffic island um, and was much, much smaller. Um, so we actually made the decision then to, to move to Lake Lucerne and, and found this hotel. However beautiful the sunset on the, the sequence that's coming up, I'm in quite interested to know what Christopher thinks about this now. I mean, because it, it's it's coming out of what we're watching now, which is the Vanessa Wilde story. We we go into something really quite dark and strange, which is um, unlike what you would expect. Well, you think something terrible has happened to her. Um, in fact, it's a sort of prefiguring of the fact that even when she claims that something terrible has happened to her later on, it hasn't, because it's just a spider. Thank you so much. She's been terrified of spiders ever since she was tiny. Well, uh, if everyone's all right, I think I'll say good night. Everyone's perfectly all right. I find those three or four lines quite adorable. I mean, there's so much sort of hidden sexual menace and sort of strangeness there that, 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 that and everybody's playing it without giving anything away. I 
And this happens two or three times, doesn't it? The sound of the... Sound the the of noise of... Whatever a... may or may not be going out, on out in the corridor. Yes. <laughs> I'm so pleased we managed to tempt you away from your desk. Oh, that's very sweet of you. You shouldn't have. They're from the garden. <laughs> I don't know if you know David Simmons. Yes. Yes, we have met at uh, Penelope Milne's, wasn't it? That's right. And this is his wife, Priscilla. How do you do? Hello. And our old friend, Jim. Something that struck me thinking about what I was going hey. to perhaps try and say on this commentary. Um, and it hadn't struck me well, before, was how, in, in a way, no ahead of its time, this novel was in the extraordinarily track. serious way it confronts what it's like to be a mistress and, and to go into the both the pleasures and the, the loneliness and agony of, of that role, which is an increasingly um, discussed role in the year 2002. But I think... Even as I did it, I didn't, well, I was younger, but I didn't know quite what that meant, I don't think. And I think that, that, that it's, it's a wonderful evocation of that loneliness. There's a line which we have at the end where, where, he, where De the Denham character says how you could buy freedom and never have to wait by a phone again. And the, and the, the notion that you're enthralled to a secret world is, is I think, most beautifully realised. She, she does have that speech where she talks about um, you're never allowed to talk about uh, lonely evenings or Sundays or cancelled holidays. And... I miss her a great deal. Mm. I think it's very poignant. She hadn't been well for some time. She needed quite a bit of looking after. One doesn't often hear of such devotion. Most men I know aren't capable of denying themselves anything. I think Anna Massey is absolutely wonderful in this film. Um, it's um, perfect as, territory for her. Yes, it's as fine as anything she's ever done. I think it's, it's mm. uh, um, and I think she knew that from the start, didn't mm. she? Mm. So, so she sort of fell upon it with the greatest, of, the greatest relish. Absolutely, I think she did. Yes, and quite rightly won the uh, BAFTA and uh, the Ace Award. Absolutely. Mm. She was also remarkably generous uh, as an actress to, to the other like people in the cast. It's not always the case with somebody who has a central role, which is, which is kind of, if one were to be extraordinarily it. brutal, yeah, nice one would describe as a, a, a blotting paper, rece receptor role, mm -hmm. uh, the observer, the writer. And, and as, as an actor or actress, you can be very threatened in that position. And, and, and she allowed everybody around her, obviously particularly Denham, to to um, give as much as they wanted to, and, and, and she wasn't vul made vulnerable by that, I don't think, at all. Electronics. electronics firm near Marlborough. She's doing surprisingly well. And your wife didn't come with you this time? No. no. She left me three years ago. Ran away with a man, ten years her junior, with whom she remains, despite all predictions, radiantly happy. How marvellous. I'm sorry. You often think about being happy? All the time. It's a mistake, if I may say so. I dare say you're in love. I think it's these series of dialogues between, between um, one particular person. Anna and Denham, which are doing that, I discovered absolutely the heart of the piece. Yes, I agree. You better tell me what it is. Well, it's simple, really. Avoid huge emotional investments and you can do what you like. If you're prepared to do the one thing that's drilled out of you from early childhood, which is to say, please yourself, there's no reason why you should ever be unhappy again. Or entirely happy either. You're a romantic, Edith. Um, may I call you Edith? Miss Hope seems unduly melancholy. Yes, but why do you call me a romantic just because I don't see things the way you do? No, it's because you're misled by what you want to believe. I mean, surely you must know, however much two people profess to love one another, there's no such thing as complete harmony. Yes. Well, then use that knowledge. You've no idea how promising the world begins to look once you've decided to have it all to yourself. But 
Suppose you prefer to share your life. Nay, much better to live it. You'd be surprised how many friends it'll make you. People feel at home with low moral standards. It's scruples that make them uneasy. There's some flaw in your reasoning. But I'm not sure I'm all that interested in finding out what it is. We've got captivated by the scene again. This life you advocate with its low moral standards. It's like, really it's like he's the tempter um, taking her to the top of the mountain. Uh, and indeed, um, tolerate low moral standards. Uh, I, I think almost my favourite moment is coming out where they You're wrong to think you cannot live without get into the cable car and you just see a flash of the steel and the, and the brutality behind this elegant facade of... Uh, Mr. Neville. My idea of absolute happiness is to sit in a hot garden all day, reading or writing, safe in the knowledge... The other thing we talked about quite a lot on a practical visual level was, was not to fall in love with the landscape, because actually what this is is a character story, and it's it, um, unlike many films in the last five years um, where one is told that plot must drive it, the, the, the plot is the character development, and and so the camera is is often very close on faces. I mean, it's, it's, to go very close on them and its face is irresistible. That's more like it. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're obviously a good woman. Why do you say that? Good women always think it's their fault when somebody else is being offensive. Bad women never take the blame for anything. We did have perfect weather, didn't we, for the shooting? It was a golden Indian summer in the middle of Europe. It was wonderful. And uh, I thought I told you. there is something about that isolation which I think got into it, mm. and that, that beauty. You don't need more love. You need less. It's love which has brought you to the Hotel du Lac out of season to sit with those women and talk about clothes. Is that what you want? No. So it's not love you need, it's marriage. Yes, I know. When you're married, you can behave as badly as everybody else. You'd be much more It's a wonderful example of Carl Davis's finesse in, in introducing a theme, of, not its positioning necessarily, but the, the tone of this cue, which, which neither sentimentalizes nor trivializes the words there. I'm sorry. You're an excellent woman and I've offended you. Please forgive me. You're a sadist. So my wife always told me. I don't know why you... Again, on a practical level, this, this scene which Chris was just been saying is so wonderful, I mean, it, it, which it, it is. Um, it was just a piece of luck that we found this ski lift where we wanted it and, and, and suddenly realised what a kind of wonderful sort of Stygian image it was. Without stretching the symbolism too far. The other practical thing is that Denham is absolutely terrified of lifts, and so it's one occasion, I think, in 25 years where I, as a director, have actually been in my own film, momentarily donning his jacket to descend. <laughs> and, and convinced me, if I needed convincing, that being an actor was not a good move. I think it's an appearance worthy of Hitchcock, or perhaps slightly more muted. Slightly more discreet, since I've never actually <laughs> noticed it. <laughs> Certainly no uh, double bases or newspapers. <laughs> I was wearing the green dress you've always disliked, safe in the knowledge that you would not be here to dislike it. Why has she got a match in her mouth? Just it's Irene. I think a toothpick, isn't it? <laughs> But there's more to come, of course. Surprise, mummy! Come on, 
Plays the maitre d' in the background was this wonderful French theatre actor Maurice Jim. Travail. Yes. yes. Um, uh, <laughs> He's a little bit reminiscent of the um, hotel hotelier in Death in Venice, who is always buzzing around Dirk Bogard in an <laughs> obsequious <laughs> fashion. Her cake, though vast, offered no clue. <laughs> Afterwards, in deference to the occasion, all the guests took coffee together in a special room set aside for the purpose. You know what I mean? I will keep it. A grand merci for votre charmante petite fête. Vraiment, madame. Vous ne prenez pas encore une verre. I can't say that Irene's French accent is all it might be. No, but she was very um, insistent that it was. Bonne nuit, madame. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Madame de Bonneuil left early, having borne it all very nobly. Poor old soul. And Mr. Neville, conversely, <laughs> arrived late. Wonderful put down. But we were a full and appreciative well, compliment. Your birthday, I understand. Yes, now where have you been, you naughty man? You missed the most magnificent cake. A birthday cake? Well, not exactly. There weren't any candles on it. Oh, I think there's a certain stage when one can dispense with candles. <laughs> yes, but what stage? Forty? Sixty? You don't look old enough to be sixty. I think one's as old as one feels. You know, sometimes I feel as if I were still a little girl. <laughs> Not when you see Jennifer, I imagine. Of course she doesn't look 60. I'm sure she has a good many birthdays to look forward to before reaching that particular milestone. Oh, now, Philip, there's no need for flattery. Flattery? I'm sure if the truth be known, you're probably younger than I am. <laughs> I'm afraid not. If you must know, I'm 79. <laughs> Can't be true. You're pulling our leg. <laughs> I'm afraid not. Well, I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable. I didn't intend to be such an aged parent. I mean, that's why we bought that lovely home in Hazelmere. The moment we saw it, we said, just right for children. Couldn't you have any? No. However hard we try. We've got the same problem. Well, it's just patience, my dear. Patience. And a little perseverance. You see, John thinks... And the result was certainly well worth waiting for. <laughs> my husband always wanted a little girl, and she kept him waiting such a long time he couldn't help spoiling her, could he, my darling? <laughs> that film of you on Twiglet! That was her pony. He used to watch it over and over again. Couldn't bear to see her in tears. I think this is a speech that in other hands could really not work at all. Yes. And, and it's, it, she just judges it perfectly and the reactions that have played and against it. Take any um, worry away from it. That was the reason why he That was actually the thing in editing, because there was such a choice of when someone was speaking of, of the group, of, of any single person in the group, you could have actually cut to to, uh, to watch their reaction. But in fact, you had very little time to shoot it, didn't you? Uh, it was it was, fairly tight. It was all right, but it, was, no, it wasn't luxurious. Um, and I think uh, it, it was greatly aided by being more or less in one place, and so he could pay yes. attention to the detail. And again, I think that's something to do with the, 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 the difference between this film and, and, and something which is chasing its own tail in terms of having to move on scenes or, or introduce oh, new characters in order to try and excite the audience. I mean, because it's so, as it were, almost magisterially assured of where it's going as a piece of fiction, 
you don't need to keep leaping off and doing um, pyrotechnics to Making excite. Making stories of yours, but I'd have thought today of all days you'd Well, uh, off you go then. <clears throat> I'll look after the caterers. Remember you haven't got all day. something for you. It was my mother's. I know she would have wanted you to have it. I don't believe in giving people a lot of food myself. Where are the asparagus tips? Jolly nice. Now, would you mind giving us a bit of elbow room? We've got another do in Traganta Road in half an hour. Look here. I brought you this in for the cake. <laughs> Hasn't been used since our wedding. Outside Chelsea Town Hall, when it when it was when you were shooting it. <laughs> Poor Jeffrey Wickham, the jilted lover. I mean, we couldn't have found a, a better actor to to, because again, a lot of the smaller parts in the film, had we not got such good people, the the. There would have been a danger of either things seeming uh, excessive or, or even, dare I say it, soapy, because the reactions have to be played so precisely and so min minimalist. Yeah, I mean, not to caricature anybody yeah. was uh, what was successfully achieved in my view. <laughs> I'm sorry, Geoffrey. I have nothing to say to you, Edith. You have made me a laughing stock. I think you will find it's I who am the laughing stock. I'm only grateful poor mother didn't live to see this. Goodbye, Geoffrey. I can't think what's happened to Edith. I'm afraid she must have been taken ill. No, I'm quite all right. Thank you for looking after everyone, Penelope. When they leave, perhaps you might ask them to take their presents away. And if anyone wants me, I'll be in the garden with my agent. Well. My dear, is there anything I can do? No. No, I'm fine. Not drowning, but waving.
something that was very pleasurable for me was to find a script which, although it's very literary and literate, and, and there is a lot of text, still has an enormous amount of space for visual breath and pleasure, and, and the sequence we've just been looking at, that, that you, uh, as it were, dramatise pages of, of the novel in two or three shots. Oh, do. I wasn't sure you were in. As you can see, there's plenty of it. We've been sitting in the dark. Barry Foster was very accurate casting. Um, it's this slightly reprehensible <laughs> but sympathetic lover. Auctioneer. A step in the right direction. <laughs> a bit of a last minute decision, wasn't it? I mean, can't have gone down too well. No, again, it was a comparatively small part for, for Barry to take. Really? Yes. Had you worked with him before? I can't remember. No, I hadn't, and 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 I was nervous he wouldn't take it, but he he so was you delighted. So calling in favours. I wasn't on that occasion. No, no. I mean, one does, but uh, and he enjoyed it enormously, and we kept in touch for for a little while afterwards. And I I, I was uh, I mean, just very taken with him. Mm. You were in love. Well, I, I come on. I certainly miss him as an actor. He's a, he's an actor you often think of in in casting and it's a shock to think that he's not with us anymore. Shot that perhaps justifies going to Switzerland. Mm. Absolutely. And it was very good on the colours of her clothes as well. She went for a whole palette of, of uh, muted blues and greens and lake colours. Mais n'ayez rien fait, monsieur. Madame, dites-leur. Mais n'ayez rien fait, madame. Would somebody tell me what's happened? Oh, Edith, how good of you to come. Well, what's the matter, Mrs. Pusey? Are you ill? No, I'm all right. It's Jennifer. Oh, will you go to her, please? Are you all right? Yes. What's going on? Nothing. Well, is, is there anything I can do for you? Mine's more coffee. Coffee? Yes. Sure you don't need a doctor or anything? Good God, no. Just look after Mummy for me, would you? Mademoiselle voudrait encore du café, s'il vous plaît. Du, du café, mais oui, mais certainement, oui, bien sûr. Je vais m'en occuper moi-même. <laughs> What's going on? Why was Monsieur Hubert shaking poor Alain? Poor Alain? I like that. What happened? Well, I couldn't sleep. I didn't get off till about dawn. And then all of a sudden I woke up and I heard a noise in Jennifer's room. A door. I was absolutely terrified. Well, she seems quite all right. Yes, thank heavens. It was that dreadful boy. Who knows what he might not have done if, if I had. Well, I'm sure there's been some misunderstanding. I never trusted him. His eyes are too small. Are you sure he wasn't just taking in Jennifer's breakfast? He'll have to go, of course. I'll speak to Monsieur Aubert about him. Well, if you're all right, I'll... Um... Oh, yes, dear, you go, you go. I know what a walker you are. <laughs> she had no fear of the hatefulness of the character. <laughs> Cookie. Well, any plans for today? Do me a favour, Edith. I never have any plans. I should have thought that was fairly obvious by now. Aren't you supposed to be a writer? And aren't writers supposed to be good at observing human nature? Hmm? I only ask because you sometimes strike me as being a bit thick. I'm sorry. Anyway, 
I gather our Mr. Neville's taken quite a shine to you. He just went for a walk. I heard you were having lunch with him again tomorrow. I reckon if you played your cards right, you could have him. I gather he's worth quite a bit. Is he? Trade, of course. Monica, I'm not after Mr. Neville. Who has money? I earn my own money. Money's what you earn when you grow up. I hate this idea of women prospecting for someone with money. Can't see what's wrong with it. It's part of a conspiracy among women who think they have some divine right to all the treats and privileges they can wheedle, who behave as badly as the Puses this morning, who feel somehow they're entitled to make illogical fusses. I think they're dishonourable. I'm very probably... I think that's real Anita Bruckner. It's as close as this book gets to a manifesto, I think. Mm. Now, look what I've got. Poor Patricia, during the shooting, because we shot this scene and the other cake scene in the same day, and she went through dozens and dozens and dozens of pastries that she had to eat. I must say I have noticed that once or twice there's not very much on her fork. <laughs> Nevertheless, she did actually finish quite a lot of them. They looked quite a treat at the start of the day, but yes. by five o'clock it was less attractive. Alison Stedman's trick is she said that whenever there's a meal, she always cuts right to the end of the meal, so she just has a few grapes and a little bit of cheese to toy with so for continuity and for, for the amount you actually that have was. to eat. She never, ever tucks Nothing. in at the beginning. I was just thinking how little vice there is around these It is oddly unattractive to see people eating on film. I don't know why, mm. why it is. It's one of those activities. But there's a sort of traditional, uh, particularly in French movies, Chabrol is very good at this, a uh, uh, way of using meals and the actual process of eating to uh, comment on various degrees of unease in the bourgeoisie. Mm. Um, and it's always very, very effective, we going to change all that. If all it involves is giving away my cardigan, I feel I should tell you I have another one at home. I suppose I could give that away as well, but I feel I'm too spiritless for radical gestures. I'm just not fascinating. No. One sees that. This scene, for example, was really oh, come on, let's more a... Uh, much more a matter of uh, Pleasure, editing and reordering than actually writing any dialogue. The dialogue is pretty much, you know, mostly from the book. Mm. Well, I suppose this is the, what you would call is the climactic scene of the, um, of the novel. I'm sorry I was so gloomy on the boat. I lost my bearings. I had the feeling we might not be allowed back. Is there so much to go back to? Oh. I'm sorry, please forgive me. You may not be a fascinating woman, Edith, but you certainly know how to make a man uncomfortable. Am I to take that as a compliment? Now, that's the sort of remark I associate with a lesser woman. You're unsettling. Why can't you just leave it at that? Why do you have to dimple and bridle like some ingenue? Am I to take that as a compliment? All right, but I'm not here to pass tests, you know. I'm supposed to be enjoying myself. You'll find one does not preclude the other. I suggest you allow me to order for you. Would you like me to describe your life in London? It's not very difficult. I'm a householder, a rate payer, a good plain cook, a deliverer of typescripts well before the deadline. Oh, I sign anything that's put in front of me. And I make no claims for my particular kind of writing, although I understand it's doing quite well. Yes, that's your persona. What I have in mind is your life. Go on, then. Let me see. You have quite a comfortable income. You go to drinks parties and dinner parties and publishers' parties. But you don't enjoy yourself. You come home alone. You're fussy about your house. You've had lovers, but not half as many as your friends have had. 
they, of course, credit you with none at all and worry about you rather ostentatiously. And yet, Edith, you do have a secret life, don't you? I think you should marry me, Edith. I'm a very discriminating man. How much of this is from the book, Christopher, and how much is yours? Uh, it's very much. It's very much from the book. It's, it's. I mean, it's the reason why uh, this kind of scene, why people make comparisons, I think, between between Anita Bruckner and Jane Austen. In other words, it's a it, it's a, a, a way of looking at. <laughs> the commonplaces of bourgeois life uh, in an in an extremely acute and uh, um, rather slightly unsettling way, mm. with a comic edge as well. Mm. And you're not making it easy for me. I'm making it easier. I've watched you at the hotel trying to talk to those women, and when you think you're alone, your expression is full of sorrow. I think I'm a hopeless case. She's very good. Anita Brooklyn is very good at wrong-footing you. You, th you, ex you think you know what it is that people are going to say and, and do, and it's sometimes just so unexpected. And what will I do in your fine house? And these scenes are quite violent, really, and they mm. have kind of quite violent undercurrent, mm. um, which makes them um, you might even find tense. You might rather better mm. than you thought you could. Edith Neville. It's a good name for an author. You do me credit. You're absolutely right that this could be You're not the, sort of the Jane Austen scene, this um, absolutely hard-headed uh, look at marriage and as a business transaction. As long as they keep their friends entertained. Most women are afraid of that sort of woman. No, most women are that sort of woman. It's a controversial assertion. <laughs> it's, I take it to be Mr. Neville's rather than Anita Brookness. Perhaps it's Anita Brookness as well. I see. You're paying me the compliment of assuming no one else will ever want me. I'm paying you the compliment of believing you'll never shame me or ridicule me or hurt my feelings. The men in the story are very concerned with their... With not being uh, shown up. Mm. This is exactly what uh, the poor deserted husband to be mm. says. He made, he's made me a laughing mm. stop. In a way, that's more important than the fact that the most important thing of all, the, more important than the fact that he's not going to have a wife at the end of the day. Interests, companionship. These are the important things as far as I'm concerned. We, <laughs> Aren't you tired of being polite to rude people? Naturally, you'll be able to entertain your friends. And you'll find, by the way, that they'll treat you quite differently. You'll be able to behave as badly as you like, and you'll be respected for it. And at last, people will start to feel comfortable with you. You're lonely, Edith. It's getting cold. Shall we go? It's a beautifully written scene, that, that one. Quite hard here to get a bad shot, isn't it? Mm. It doesn't look... Please don't cry, Edith. I can't bear... I don't know. It's cry. not... You know, you do need <laughs> thick shots. Well, it's a beguiling place. I mean, it's like shooting in Venice or, or um, somewhere that, that, that's wrap around beautiful. But, um, but actually, uh, the, uh, this particular scene, I remember, we had enormous problems because it was too sunny, and we we wanted to have a kind of solo ombre feel, and 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 kept trying to manoeuvre this enormous great paddle steamer around into shadow, and uh, it's. I mean, I remember that the the, the uh, geraniums outside the hotel were too red for us, and, yes. we, and we put nets on them. And there was there's quite a lot of discreet work done in the art and costume department to to create a palette, um, no, to put it pretentiously, that that, that works. I mean, mm. I mean, in one sense, people mistake um, 
Anita Bruckner's tone has been watercolour in a wishy-washy way, and in fact it's not, nothing of the sort. I mean, there's a huge strength in the deliberation of the, the way that she writes, and I think we did, uh, again, without being pretentious, try and, try and match that in the photography and the art direction. Not to worry, though. I'm sure it won't last. And it's quite a risky business, in a sense, um, because they are long scenes with a lot of speaking. And I think that, that you, it's one reason the camera stays so close. It's why when you cut progress. back to a wide shot, it has to well, earn its keep as a beautiful like a shot so that you're not diluting so the essence of what's been said. And, and all that was a, a, a kind of almost, I don't know whether it's instinctive, but it's a kind of mathematical pleasure too mm. to, to make those the place work for you. I think, I mean, if, had we been in cars and trains and aeroplanes, I think it would be a completely different film. Mm. The, 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 the kind of mechanistic clockwork nature of, of Switzerland, boats running on time, and, but people behaving badly is quite, by way of contrast, is quite interesting. Total failure. By this time next year, they'll pension me off. It's interesting what you said about the, the length of scenes, because this does actually have a lot of scenes that uh, go on the length that they go on, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Harder to do now. Yes, yes. I think that an audience has been educated and, and learnt to uh, require pictures coming at them faster and for changes, for changes of shot, for mm. changes of angle, for, for visual sensation. And, and it, 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 it's, it's harder to make a slower, in inverted commas, film mm. now, I agree. Particularly for television, where you don't have the, the scale of picture to enjoy. the end of next week, if they'll have us. Although I think that actually mercifully is changing with bigger screens. I think it's a huge advantage that, that you can hold shots long. You don't have to cut for purely for effect. Well, my husband did the same thing. There are always arrangements to be made. Arrangements? You're not leaving us, are you? Oh, Jennifer, do you hear that? The day after tomorrow. Oh. Oh, dear, oh, dear. And you've been out all day. If you'll excuse me. Yes, of course, my dear. Good night. Please. Who made the piano selections? Well, I did with Carl. I mean, it was something which I was quite proud of because I, I think it's partly to do with what I was saying about spending so much of my teenage years sitting being bored rigid in, in hotel dining uh, uh, drawing rooms. And, and, and we actually used a, a guide track, which the hotel pianist did for us extremely roughly. Uh, and, and, and I took it in with great pride to, to Carl and said, this is what we've got to use. And he said, well, it's an idea anyhow. And then he got a, he got a pianist to do it who actually, to start with, couldn't do it at all. And we had to get somebody else because he was playing it too well. And he, he thought that he was giving a concert performance and, and wouldn't go for the necessary um, swoops and yeah, sort of overemphasis, yes, mm. yeah. But at least we are without But it is quite a binding yeah. factor in the film, I think, and, and, it, and, and it allows you to be sentimental without being sentimental, if you know what I mean. I lived for you. We did use the same pianist late in the evenings, who would, um, Patricia Hodge and Googie would sing. And well, I seem to remember the producer dancing quite extensively yes, as well. Yes, with, with uh, Denham Elliott, who's you, in, a brilliant dancer. <laughs> well, I don't think you were far behind. This sequence I'm very proud of, I mean, just as a, as a, as a, as a show-off director sequence, because it, 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 it works, it flows, I think, and, and it, it, it binds together the different themes, take out the point that we were making earlier about the, the loneliness of the waiting mistress and uh, without again i hope being I sentimental be a good wife to him. one does not receive proposals no it's actually a rather complex selection of images which complement the letter very well i think and seem to have accepted them both no doubt as a result of what i have begun to understand about us I know you always thought I wrote my stories with a mechanical and detached cynicism. You were wrong. I believed every word of them. I still do. You've known my address for the past two weeks, but I haven't heard from you. Therefore, there seems no point in telling you where I shall be living. I don't know how to end this letter. I feel sure we shall never meet again. So, 
all my love. Always. She does leave you with a genuinely difficult question. Is she doing the right thing at the end or not? Hello? Hope. I'd like you to get me a ticket on the next flight to London. And I'd also like to send a telegram to David Simmons, Chiltern Street, London, W1. And the message is, coming home. No, sorry, that's wrong. Just put, returning. I think that shot as a director is, is probably where I started. I and mean, that's a shot I probably did at age nine on my father's 60 mil camera. And then all those years later, was allowed by Christopher Hampton and Sue Birtwistle to go and do it properly. And, and um, just want to thank them for that opportunity, even though many years have passed since. Were you coming home or returning? <laughs> <laughs> Moving sideways, possibly. I must say, it was an immense pleasure, this whole experience it to, was. to work on. It was wonderful, yes. Well, thank you both. I've enjoyed revisiting it. <laughs> yes, it's been very interesting to see it again. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Well, if we can either write or persuade uh, the author to do a sequel, we'll, we'll all be booking our flights. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. This time I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.